So thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say that I'm very pleased that so many people want to listen to lectures about Bainite, so I'm very happy to be here. And there are going to be four lectures. Uh, I, I will deal with uh, the microstructure and the mechanism of transformation today. Okay? And tomorrow we'll deal with uh, the properties and the so-called super Bainite. And I'm going to begin from uh, a very elementary level and take you up to a point where you can actually use what you learn here to design new steels. Okay, so that is the aim of these lectures, is to go through the entire theory for Bainite to a point where you can actually do calculations to design better steels. So the lectures will be successful if you actually use the material to design something new. Stop me if you have any questions during, uh, during the lectures. First of all, um, I have given you some lecture notes, but in fact, if you go to this uh, website, you can download a complete book on Bainite free of charge. So there's about 500 pages of book there with lots and lots of information. So you can simply download it from that website. Now, we know that um, a lot of the calculations that we do can be quite complicated. But every single thing that I'm going to talk about is implemented in computer programs which you can also get from this website here, the POSTEC website. So there's a whole library of computer programs which allow you to do the calculations very easily uh, that I'm going to talk about. Now this is a, a microstructure of steel and it's a very complicated microstructure. There are many, many phases. Here, for example, is perlite. This is uh, martensite. You have here bainite. This is a uh, grain boundary or electromorphic ferrite. And you also have some Wiedmannstaden ferrite. And this is typically the sort of microstructure that you find in industry. It's not a very simple microstructure where you only have bainite or you only have martensite. It's usually a mixture of many different kinds of phases. So in order to understand one phase, you also need to know about all the other phases that exist in steels. So I'm going to introduce a whole sequence of phases so that you can put bainite in context and you know what the difference is between bainite and all the other phases. Okay. So to understand bainite, we must consider all the other microstructures that happen in steel. Can we talk to you in Sol Oh, we cannot see your pointer on your screen, so could you indicate your point by using your uh, cursor? Mouse? Yes, I'll do that. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. So, in order to uh, understand bainite, we have to consider all the microstructures that happen in steels. We can't think of bainite in isolation. Okay. Right, so this is a phase diagram, and it's a phase diagram for pure iron, okay? Completely pure iron, nothing at all in it apart from iron. And we are plotting here temperature and over here the pressure. And there are three different crystal structures that happen in iron. First of all, we have ferrite, which you are all familiar with. It's a body-centered cubic crystal structure. We have austenite, which is stable at higher temperatures and it's a face-centered cubic crystal structure. And delta ferrite here, which happens close to the melting temperature, is the same as alpha ferrite. It's body-centered cubic iron. Now, at very high pressures, you also get another form of iron, which is called uh, epsilon, or hexagonal closed-packed iron. These are the three different crystal structures. This is the structure of ferrite, where we have an atom in the center of the cube, and an atom at the corner of each cube. This is austenite, atom at each corner and at the center of each face. And this is hexagonal iron, which happens at very, very high pressures, 130,000 atmospheres, or if you alloy your steel with a lot of manganese. So for example, in some kinds of TWIP steels, TWIP steels, you can actually get epsilon iron forming because manganese stabilizes epsilon iron. Okay. 
Okay. So these are the three different crystal structures of iron which I will be talking about. And of course we have this really complicated messy structure which is uh, cementite. Um, these are the iron atoms and these are the carbon atoms. So there, there are a lot of atoms inside the unit cell of cementite and because it's a very complicated crystal structure it's not easy to get slip deformation. So it's a very brittle phase and it's one of the phases that we need to avoid when dealing with bainite and I will show you how to avoid cementite when we come to bainite. Okay, uh, we also need to think about where carbon sits inside the crystal structure of iron. So in the case of austenite, it is inside these octahedral holes. Okay, so octahedral means here we are surrounded by eight of these triangular faces. And one thing I'd like you to notice is that in the case of austenite, this octahedron is beautiful and all the triangles are of the same size. Okay, so it's a regular octahedron. So the presence of a carbon atom in austenite causes a uniform expansion of austenite. Okay? Now, a uniform expansion uh, means a hydrostatic strain. And that doesn't interfere with dislocation motion as much as if the strain was not isotropic. So carbon doesn't cause a great deal of hardening in austenite. Okay? However, when you put carbon atom in ferrite, this distance here is different from this distance here. So it causes a tetragonal distortion. And a tetragonal distortion can interfere with both the shear and the dilatation of strain fields of dislocations. So it causes a huge amount of hardening in ferrite, but not in austenite. Okay. Purely because of the way, the way in which the carbon atom is located inside the ferrite. Here, this hole is not a symmetrical hole. In this case, all the triangles are, have equal edges and therefore you only get an isotropic expansion. So this is very important to understand that carbon in ferrite causes a huge amount of hardening because the strain is anisotropic. Okay? But in austenite it's weak hardening because the strain is isotropic and it can't interfere with the shear strain fields of dislocations. So those are the elements of uh, the different crystalline phases we get in steel and the location of carbon atoms inside the steel. And of course, uh, if the story finished there, then steel would be very simple because we only have these three different crystal structures to play with. But you can change from austenite to ferrite by many different parts, okay? different mechanisms of transformation. And that's what gives us the huge variety of crystal structures that we get in uh, steels. So we now go on to the iron carbon phase diagram and you know you're familiar with this. This is the eutectoid composition here which is about 0.8 weight percent carbon and of course that will be influenced by alloying elements uh, and the reactions that we are interested in is taking austenite here and either cooling it rapidly to low temperatures or cooling it slowly, passing through a whole range of phase transformations, doing isothermal transformation, whatever. But we don't want to produce an equilibrium microstructure because an equilibrium microstructure is too coarse and doesn't have good mechanical properties. What we want is very, very fine microstructures which are strong and which are tough. And for that we have to abandon the equilibrium phase diagram. We have to look at the kinetics of transformations. And when we look at the kinetics, the rate at which atoms can move determines how the crystal structure changes. So imagine that this is austenite, okay? And we have two different kinds of atoms. It could be, you know, manganese being the square atoms and iron being the round atoms. And this is the crystal structure of austenite. Let's imagine that. Now there are two ways in which I can change the crystal structure of austenite into that of ferrite. The first one is without any diffusion at all. Okay? If I simply deform this so that the pattern in which the atoms are arranged changes, then look, I've got a new crystal structure here of ferrite and there's absolutely no diffusion necessary. This atom here 
comes exactly from this point here. This one is from here and there is no diffusion needed in creating the ferrite. Of course, if we deform the austenite crystal, then its shape also changes. Okay? So, this shape change, when it happens inside steel, will cause a lot of strain energy because it's pushing against all the other crystals around it. So this kind of a transformation is not an equilibrium transformation. It is a non-equilibrium transformation. There's a lot of strain energy even if these, uh, oops, sorry, even if the square atoms want to go into the austenite during the transformation, they can't. They're trapped in that location. So there is no composition change, there's a huge amount of strain energy and it's not an equilibrium transformation. It will happen at temperatures where atoms can't move easily. Okay, that means below about 500 degrees centigrade. On the other hand, I can take the austenite, I can break all the bonds and rearrange them into this pattern by diffusion. Okay? Now, when there is diffusion, there is no change in shape because the diffusion will happen in a way which eliminates this change of shape. So imagine this transformation, then I cut this triangle over here and I put it over here. That's the diffusion necessary to produce transformations like ferrite and perlite and so forth. You must have diffusion. And during that process, some of the atoms will go into the ferrite and others will go into the austenite. So you will get a change in chemical composition. And these are transformations which are closer to equilibrium. Okay? So by these two different mechanisms of transformation, we can produce a huge variety of microstructures and that is the power of steels. You know, with the same composition you can get a huge range of mechanical properties and microstructures. So, just to summarize, uh, these are the different kinds of phase transformations. These are the diffusional transformations and these are the displacive transformations. We are going to focus on bainite, but I will talk about martensite, about Wiedmann-Staten ferrite, allotriomorphic and idiomorphic ferrite, which in industry is just known as ferrite, uh, and perlite. So these transformations require a lot of diffusion. These transformations do not. And you need to understand them all in order to actually understand bainite. Right? Because very often I get asked the question, what is the difference between bainite and martensite? In these lectures, I will explain you the difference in a quantitative fashion so that you can actually calculate microstructures. And kinetics is usually expressed in terms of a uh, time temperature transformation diagram. And actually the time temperature transformation diagram is very simple. There are only two C curves. Okay? The martensite is very easy. If you cool faster than this rate, then you will get martensitic transformation. The top part represents diffusional transformations. They can only happen above a temperature of about five or 600 degrees centigrade. Okay? So this is ferrite, you can see here, and this is perlite. They cannot happen at low temperatures. Then we have this set of displacive transformations. Wiedemann sudden ferrite always in the form of plates, and I will explain why they have to be in the form of plates. Upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite. And you should not consider any theory of transformations to be complete unless it can explain all of these transformations in a consistent way and quantitatively. Okay, so that is the aim of these lectures, is to give you a scheme which allows you to design the microstructure <coughs> without saying, oh, bainite should look like this, or weedman staden ferrite should look like this. You should be able to calculate where these different phases form. Okay, so the first, first uh, transformation is the high temperature transformation, which you normally call just ferrite, but I have divided it into two parts, the allotriomorphic ferrite and idiomorphic ferrite. Okay. Now the difference is very simple. Uh, allotriomorphic ferrite 
forms at the austenite grain boundaries. And the austenite grain boundaries are easy paths for diffusion. So the layer of ferrite grows around the austenite grain boundaries and its shape is very irregular because it's not determined by crystallography but by the fact that it grows along the grain boundaries. Okay? So allotriomorph is a Greek term meaning that it has an irregular shape which doesn't reflect its crystalline symmetry. Okay. Now recently, uh, you know, POSCO and other steel companies have also been adding non-metallic particles to steel to stimulate nucleation of ferrite inside the austenite grain. Okay. So idiomorphic ferrite are particles of ferrite which form inside the austenite grain. Therefore, they are not influenced by the grain boundary and they have a nice crystallographic shape. So its shape reflects to some extent its crystalline symmetry and that's the meaning of idiomorphic ferrite, intragranularly nucleated ferrite. But they both form by exactly the same mechanism. Their shapes are different. This is an idiomorph of ferrite and you can see it has got some straight faces consistent with its crystallography. And this is a grain boundary. It's forming along the austenite grain boundary. Now, one of the problems is that the micrographs I'm showing you are very simple. You know, th there's a small amount of ferrite that has formed and then I've quenched the steel to look at that. But that's not how you see it in industry. You know, you see it when the steel has reached room temperature. So these phases will look different. Here is what allotriomorphic ferrite will look like in a 0.4 carbon steel. These are the layers of ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries and this of course is the perlite that forms after the ferrite. If I reduce the carbon concentration then it will look like this because all the grains are now touching each other. You can see the grains of ferrite are now touching each other and you're left with very little of perlite. Okay? So you have to distinguish between a partially transformed specimen where we can see clearly what's happening at the early stages of transformation and after all the grains have actually touched each other the shape might look completely different. Okay? These transformations require diffusion. Even if substitutional elements are not diffusing, the iron atoms must diffuse to avoid strain. So that cannot happen at any reasonable rate if the temperature is less than about 600 degrees centigrade. Okay? Okay, so as we go down in temperature and assuming that the austenite has sufficient carbon, we will end up with perlite, the perlite reaction. So can anybody tell me what is perlite? What is your understanding of perlite? Ferrite, ferrite and cementite. Very good. Uh, so it's the cooperative growth of ferrite and cementite from austenite and you know this is what it looks like. Okay? And in many textbooks this is described as alternating layers of ferrite and cementite. Yeah, you can see these layers. But this is very misleading. It isn't actually alternating layers of ferrite and cementite, but a bicrystal of ferrite and cementite interpenetrating each other. So the actual crystallographic size of perlite is the colony, not the distance between the cementite lamellae. This is what you should think about perlite. Yeah? Think of the cabbage as the cementite. It's a single crystal of cementite. You put it inside water, the water, the bucket of water, is the single crystal of ferrite. So you have a single crystal of cementite penetrating, interpenetrated by a single crystal of ferrite. And this was shown many years ago by Hillert when he did serial sectioning of the perlite to show that all the lamellae of cementite are connected in three dimensions. Now, from an industrial point of view, this is very important. Because if you make the distance between the cementite leaves finer, that doesn't improve the toughness. That increases the strength, but it doesn't improve the toughness because the crystallographic unit is the cabbage. So a crack will go without deviation across that whole colony. 
Okay? So when we make rail steels, and we make them harder and harder by making finer perlite, we don't actually improve the toughness because the crystallographic size is still the colony of perlite. And that is very clear from modern instruments. This, for example, is an orientation imaging map of perlite. And you can see that this whole area has the same color, indicating the crystallography is the same in that region. Okay? So as far as a crack is concerned, it can go across this without much deviation. Right? So think of perlite in three dimensions as an interpenetrating bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. So even if we make it finer, we are not going to get better toughness. Okay? We will get better strength because the strength depends on the interlamellar spacing. Uh, this is a very fine perlite. Um, obviously, when, we, when I showed you this micrograph here, this is an optical micrograph and we can see the spacing. But when we get to fine perlite like this, you can't resolve this optically and it will look like a grey mess. Okay? You have to use transmission electron microscopy or field emission gun, scanning electron microscopy to see very fine perlite. Perlite, I said to you, is a diffusional transformation and substitutional elements have to partition between cementite and ferrite during the formation of perlite. There is no way that you can form perlite without the partitioning of substitutional solutes, right? So this, this is simply showing you perlite which has formed at a very low temperature and still we are getting differences in the silicon, the manganese concentrations, in the cementite and ferrite. So perlite cannot form without diffusion. And this is how you see it in industry, the perlite, because the steel that you make contains chemical segregation of manganese. Okay? So the perlite forms last in the manganese rich regions and you see bands of ferrite and perlite. Yeah? The ferrite first forms in the low manganese regions, partitions carbon, so the remaining austenite then transforms to perlite. And that is why you see this microstructural banding. In most commercial ferrite perlite steels you will see this. And that is because of the existence of manganese concentration variations. So in the manganese rich regions you find perlite, in the manganese depleted regions you find ferrite. Okay, martensite is possibly the simplest of all transformations because it nucleates without diffusion and it grows without diffusion. So it's very, very simple to calculate. It's a diffusion-less transformation which happens at a critical temperature which is called the martensite start temperature. And there's no question about its mechanism of transformation. So here we have the crystal structure of ferrite and the crystal structure of austenite. And we've got to work out a way in which we can change austenite to ferrite simply by a deformation because that's what martensite is. It's a deformation driven by a chemical free energy change. Now how can I change this complicated uh, crystal structure of austenite here to this crystal structure by a deformation? Just by looking at these pictures it's not very obvious. But in 1924 Bain actually described how this should happen. If I take uh, this unit cell of austenite and put two unit cells next to each other, they look like this. Okay? So these are two unit cells of austenite. Now inside this, I can draw a pattern which is a body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. Okay? So all I've done is I've labeled certain atoms red and drawn a pattern there which is a body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. Now it becomes very easy to see how to form ferrite. All I have to do is compress along the vertical axis and expand along the other two axes to get ferrite. So that mechanism is correct. If you do first principles calculations, elasticity calculations, this is the lowest strain energy mechanism of changing austenite into ferrite. Okay? It's called the Bain strain. But it's still is a very high strain energy. Okay? And most 
Most steels cannot support that level of strain. So additional deformations are needed, which change this into a shear. Okay? A shear gives you the minimum strain energy. And I'm not going to go into those additional deformations, but the consequences of those deformations you can see in the microstructure. So the main strain by itself gives you too much strain energy. So the system adds further deformations which changes the shape into that of a shear. And if you look very carefully inside the microstructure of some martensites, you can see these uh, very fine twins. Okay? Now those twins are a consequence of trying to reduce the strain energy of the Bain deformation. Okay? And this is of course the famous theory of uh, martensite crystallography which beautifully gives you everything about martensite. So it precisely predicts the orientation relationship, the habit plane, and the exact nature of the shape deformation. But that is a, a too long a story to tell you today. However, you know that you can have a deformation which will change austenite into ferrite and some additional deformations to reduce the strain energy further. So if you polish a specimen of austenite completely flat, okay, mirror finish, and you allow it to transform to martensite, the surface will change. And this is an interference micro, uh, micrograph, a Nomaski interference micrograph, which shows the surface has been deformed by very large shear deformations. Okay? So the, the, this is a direct consequence of the diffusion-less mechanism of transformation. Now, even though this is a shear deformation, so if we look at austenite here and we transform it to martensite, then we will get a shear deformation here. So this shear is about 0 0.26. It's a very, very large strain. You know, an elastic strain in steel is about 0 0.001, 0 0.001, okay? It's a 0.1%. This is 26% shear. So it's a very large deformation. Okay. And there's, of course, there's also a, a volume change here. This, which is about 3%. Now, this shear and the volume change cause strain energy because this crystal is pushing against many other crystals inside the steel. Yeah. And that strain energy scales with the shear modulus of the austenite. So this is the shear modulus of the austenite. And this is the thickness divided by the length. So here, here we are, here's the plate. Unfortunately, the symbols on this slide have changed, okay? Uh, but don't worry. Uh, the thickness is the C and R is the length. The sm thinner I can make the plate, the smaller is the strain energy, okay? And that is why martensite is always in the form of a plate. And that is why bainite is always in the form of a plate. And that is why Weidmann-Staden ferrite is always in the form of a plate. Okay. Whenever you see a plate-shaped ferrite in steel, you can bet that there will be a shape deformation. Okay. Now, there is a, a major consequence of this on mechanical properties again. You see, if you are changing the austenite to ferrite by a deformation, that deformation can only happen in one austenite grain. It cannot propagate across the grain boundary. So martensite plates are confined to the grain in which they form. Whereas ferrite, allotriomorphic ferrite, can grow across grain boundaries because it involves diffusion, random movement of atoms. Okay? So, <coughs> here you can see martensite plates are stopped at an austenite grain boundary. That means that if you have a fully martensitic steel, your prior austenite grain boundaries are left in the microstructure. Okay? With ferrite, they will be destroyed because the ferrite grains grow across the austenite grain boundaries. Now, those prior austenite grain boundaries are very good places for phosphorus and sulfur to segregate. And then you get temper embrittlement. So martensitic steels, bainitic steels are susceptible to temper embrittlement because of segregation of phosphorus, uh, 
and segregation of elements like sulfur to the prior austenite grain boundaries. And this is a direct consequence of the mechanism of transformation. And if you don't control this, then you get failure like this at the austenite grain boundaries. So whenever we design bain steels which are predominantly martensitic or bainitic, we have to do something to control temporary embrittlement. Because when you produce a steel by continuous cooling transformation, you will get segregation of impurities to the prior austenite grain boundaries. Okay? And th this is quite a spectacular failure to happen. It will happen in thick sections because the cooling rate is slower in thick sections. This is what uh, martensite can look like uh, in very heavily alloyed steels. You see very clear plates of martensite separated by these regions of austenite. But in the vast majority of steels, it looks like this. Uh, you know, it's very fine microstructure. Individual plates are not easy to distinguish because there isn't much retained austenite. And when you look in a transmission electron micrograph, again, they are in the form of plates here, and there might be very, very little retained austenite between the plates of martensite. So apart from uh, the boundaries between the martensite plates, there isn't a great deal of microstructure in martensite. So when you etch it, it appears very light. Okay? And I'll come back to this point later on when we look at complicated structures on how to distinguish bainite and martensite okay. using optical microscopy. Okay, so we now get on to the topic of the lectures, which is bainite. And there are two forms of bainite. You can see upper bainite and lower bainite. The upper bainite forms at a relatively higher temperature than lower bainite. And the difference is very, very simple. In the case of upper bainite, we have cementite particles in between the plates of ferrite. Okay. So this, uh, the thickness of the plate is about 10 micrometers, uh, sorry, thickness is about 0 0.2 micrometers, and the length is about 10 micrometers. Now, lower bainite is very similar, except that you also have precipitation of cementite inside the plates of ferrite. Now, because you have that precipitation, there is less cementite here and here between the plates. So this is actually a tougher microstructure than upper bainite, because in upper bainite, the cementite particles are coarse. Okay. Can you hear me without the microphone? Yeah, can you hear me without the microphone? In Guanyang? Yeah. Okay, so I will, I will keep on using the microphone. Okay, so there are these two forms of bainite which you need to explain. Okay. And they are very, very well established. Uh, this is a transmission electron micrograph because if the plates of bainite are 0 0.2 micrometers thick, you can't resolve them using optical microscopy. Optical microscopy uses light which has a wavelength of a half a micrometer. Okay. So you see the very fine plates of bainite with cementite in between. And that cementite is bad for toughness. And this is lower bainite, several micrographs of lower bainite. Uh, the thing I want you to notice here is that, look, we've got these cementite particles inside the plates of bainite, as well as between the plates of bainite. Okay? So the only difference between upper and lower bainite is the distribution of cementite particles. This is a, a very interesting micrograph is taken on two different surfaces. Okay, so the vertical edge there separates two surfaces. And the reason is that we want to see the shape in three dimensions of bainite. Okay, so if I show you the shape here of this single plate here, you can see that is a plate in three dimensions. Okay, so it's very important. Uh, the shape of bainite is like that of a plate in three dimensions. Now, the rest of this here is martensite, and this is etched using nitel. You can see that the bainite etches much more than the martensite. Okay? The martensite has no cementite particles in it because it's 
formed by diffusion-less transformation. But bainite etches very dark. So if you have a mixture of bainite and martensite, it's very easy to distinguish them. With the same amount of etching, the bainite will be attacked much more because of all the particles inside the bainite, right? the cementite particles. But actually, there is much more structure inside bainite than can be seen from this optical micrograph. Uh, what appears there, you know, look at the scale, it's 50 micrometers there. What appears there to be a single plate of bainite actually consists of thousands of much smaller plates of bainite. So if I take this, oh, f first of all, of course, uh, the reason why it's a thin plate shape is the strain energy that I explained earlier. The strain energy, of course, comes from the fact that the austenite is deformed in order to produce the bainite. So if I, again, transform uh, a completely polished specimen of austenite into bainite, there will be a deformation. And this is an atomic force micrograph atomic force image, microscope image, of the displacements caused by bainite. Okay. So you can see you can see the shear that has been caused. So this, this is austenite here, and this is the shear caused by the bainite, a very large shear deformation. There's one other thing that I want you to see from this image. The austenite here, adjacent to the bainite, has also been deformed plastically. Okay? And this is because bainite forms at a relatively high temperature compared with martensite. And the austenite doesn't have much strength. So if you're going to cause a shear of 0 0.26, then it will deform the adjacent austenite. You will introduce lots and lots of dislocations inside the austenite. Now, this is what uh, is actually happening. Uh, if, if the shape change was accommodated purely elastically, there would be nothing happening in the austenite. You would simply get this deformation. But the austenite is weak at high temperatures, so you get plasticity in the adjacent austenite. It is not able to support a shear of 0 0.26 elastically. So you introduce a lot of dislocations in the austenite adjacent to the bainite. That has a major effect on the microstructure because dislocations can stop the bainite transformation completely. You see, the martensite and bainite are deformations. If you work harder than the austenite, then you stop the transformation. Okay? So here the bainite is causing the deformation and in the process killing itself because it can't go further, okay? And that's the reason why uh, uh, this is a transmission electron micrograph uh, showing you the huge number of dislocations between the bainite and the austenite. And you can see the austenite has been severely deformed, right? And these dislocations stop the movement of the interface. So optically what we see as a plate of bainite actually consists of thousands of small platelets. Here, you can see these tiny, tiny, tiny platelets, which are 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness. They grow to a certain size and then stop because of the dislocations. And then you have to nucleate another plate, and another plate, and another plate. And that's how this transformation propagates. So you can see the plate over here is the same size as the plate at the beginning. So the plates of bainite only grow to a certain size, and then they stop dead. Yeah, roughly about 10 micrometers. Even if your austenite grain is 100 micrometers in size, each plate of bainite is very small because the plasticity stops the transformation. You have to nucleate a new plate and a new plate and a new plate and so on. So this is called the subunit mechanism of transformation. But when you look optically, the whole cluster of plates looks like a single plate. Okay? All of this we need to explain. Okay, now, I said to you this is a, a diffusion-less uh, transformation, okay? Uh, so we did some experiments to look at the distribution of atoms between the bainite and the austenite. And these are, are field ion micrographs. Field ion microscopy, you can see individual atoms. So each dot here is a single atom, 
And here we have an interface between the bainite and the austenite. All right? Here we are looking at all the atoms. Here we are looking at just the iron atoms, just the silicon atoms. And you can see that the substitutional solutes are uniformly distributed. Yeah. So apart from producing these images, you can, you can pick atoms out and analyze them and look at everything atom by atom quantitatively and demonstrate that with the Bainite transformation, there is no movement of substitutional atoms on the finest scale of observation. Okay? So the only role that substitutional elements are playing in Bainite is to affect the thermodynamics of transformation, the relative stability of austenite and of ferrite. Okay. So what kind of observation is this? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what kind of observation is this? This is an instrument called an atom probe, where you can see individual atoms and you can chemically analyze individual atoms. Okay. And we, we have this instrument in POSTAC. Yeah. A much better one than when I did these experiments many years ago. So the only role of substitutional elements in bainite is to affect the relative stability of austenite and ferrite, in other words, the hardenability. They do not diffuse. But look at that last, last picture here. This is the image of the carbon atoms. And it looks like the carbon has diffused into the austenite. Right? So is it the case? that carbon diffuses during the formation of bainite? Or is it the case that when I did this experiment, the bainite has effectively been tempered? So it was diffusionless, but the carbon afterwards diffused. Okay, so let's, let's just examine that. Just because we observe a different composition in the austenite and in the ferrite, it doesn't mean that the diffusion happened during the bainite reaction. Okay, so let's imagine.